Good afternoon. I thank the order, organisers for their invitation and congratulate them on the enormous work involved in running a symposium like this in a format safe for the crazy times we live in. It would be nicer, of course, to all be together in Kildare Street, where I spent many hours pondering the question of generalism and specialism when I was doing my end-of-year assessment on my SBR scheme. I would convince the gastroenterology NSTs of my unswerving commitment to that particular art and science before then going across the hall and sheepishly admitting to the GIM trainers that I was half ashamed almost to be doing gastroenterology on the side and that general medicine was my true calling. Remarkably, I managed to keep both sides satisfied for five years. Now I have to pick a side, and well, I hope I can bring you with me. We're here today, as I said, to discuss the merits of generalism versus specialism. This photograph was taken the day I finished my finals. Of that group of 10, we have become three physicians, three anesthesiologists, three general practitioners, and a psychiatrist. But that day, we were all just really happy to be doctors. It helps to remind ourselves that we all start off as generalists. Yet within 12 months, we pick a tribe and we tend to buy into it. The most diligent medical intern reduces her physical exam to a crudely drawn pair of lungs with an arrow running through them within a week of becoming the specialty surgery SHO. The medical SHO, by comparison, once surgical internship is behind him, finds no clerking is complete without the words PR deferred being written down. Equally, I am amused by specialists, many of whom have not darkened the door of unselected medical take for many years as the last of the true generalists. On the contrary, this college alone graduates about 300 generalists every year from BST who have successfully trained in general internal medicine and completed an arduous and rigorous set of examinations to prove their credentials in it. They are hard as steel generalists, forged in a hot fire, in demand the world over for both the breadth and depth of their skills. By the time most practitioners of the big medical specialties come to CCST, they are extensively trained and certified in general medicine for nine or ten years. There is no shortage of generalists. In Ireland, in recent years, we have tended to limit the access of patients to the many benefits of the expertise of well-trained, highly functional hospital generalists to those at the extremes of age. However, we know patients value personalised continuity of care and coordination rather than the piecemeal care delivered by multiple autonomous specialists, frequently in an Irish setting, across multiple sites using several different charts and with no online integration. Why should patients aged between the ages of 16 and 70 miss out? I worry that conversations like this one take too far too narrow a view of specialism and generalism. Specialism in medicine is about far more than diseases, organ systems or procedures. Specialists such as general practitioners and emergency medicine physicians see everyone. Within our own discipline, acute medical physicians do the same, albeit with specific specialist knowledge defined by the acute phase of care and the mobilisation of services. Geriatricians have a role defined by complexity, frailty, multidisciplinary and cross-agency working, and the age and related multiple morbidities of patients. Multimorbidity places a significant premium on the services of the generalist, as patients stubbornly refuse to have only one problem, all too frequently failing to recognise the depth of expertise of the doctor in front of them in the minutiae of one of their problems, and selfishly steering the conversation off course in ways that are more likely to be relevant to their own health and needs. In 2012, a Scottish study of over 3 million people showed that living with three or more long-term medical conditions was the norm for people over 65, with the poor suffering most, as we see in this graph. The proportion of people with four or more long-term conditions is expected to rise from 9.8% of the population in 2015 to 17% in 2035, with two-thirds of those having dementia, depression or cognitive impairment. It is a sign of a culture in medicine that can be slow to adapt and insular that we're having this debate at all. In large multinational corporations, the debate about generalism and specialism has long since been put to bed. In the world of business, it is the T-shaped talent that is most prized. T-shaped professionals are characterised by their broad generalist knowledge base, such as that instilled by a basic medical degree, BST and HST, but also deep disciplinary knowledge in at least one area an understanding of systems and their ability to function as adaptive innovators and cross the boundaries between disciplines. This is in stark contrast to the narrow interest of the I-shaped model of knowing a tremendous amount about one thing or one area. Or the polymath, 
that is rare as hen's teeth, but that we all know one or two of in medicine. The idea that in medicine we have such a wealth of T-shaped talent and are talking about getting rid of it, I assure you will be met with incredulity in the silicon docks in Dublin. In a medical context, I propose that to be a T, you need three E's. First, empathy. Important because it allows people to imagine the problem from another person's perspective, to stand in their shoes. Secondly, enthusiasm. They tend to get very enthusiastic about other people's disciplines to the point that they will learn from them and may actually start to practice them. And finally, energy, to meet the competing demands of generalism and specialism in a modern hospital environment. As such, the onus falls on the system to devise a set of working conditions to enable our workforce of medical consultants to stay as T's by enabling them to conserve their resources of energy, enthusiasm and empathy all of which are finite and which we all know will wax and wane over the course of a 30-year consultant career. To do this, general medicine must assert itself, and in my opinion, there has never been a better time to do this. It is widely accepted that the hospital system performed very well during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The overwhelming majority of hospitalised patients in Ireland were cared for by teams led by T-shaped specialists who do GIM. Freed from the competing demands of juggling scheduled and unscheduled care and many of the other irritations of hospital life, they were free to concentrate on their patients and on their craft, and unsurprisingly, they were very good at it. Let's take those lessons forward. Let's define what general medicine is, and equally importantly, what it isn't, which is being a hospitalist. When faced with the demands of being a generalist, a hospitalist, or an organ-slash-system specialist, nobody can be any more than two to any great effect. Journalists also need to feel like they are not the final common pathway for all the messy, untidy bits of medicine that other people don't want to do. The mantra of admit under the medics and we'll see and consult is a dereliction of duty, and we need to start calling that out. It might make us feel like the adults in the room to step up and stop the childish game playing and pass the parcel over the care of a human being, but it can also make us burnt out. It's not unreasonable to expect a collaborative approach, and in the long run, we do patients no favours when we eschew that. In fact, for the specialty physician with a role in the general medical take, ward rounds can sometimes feel like an endless series of battles on unfamiliar terrain. You simply can't make that attractive, even to the most flexible of T-shaped doctors. A moment of introspection in medicine might enable us to recognise that by failing to assert the role of general medicine, we have allowed others to do it for us. This has turned what is without question the core business of the modern hospital in the 21st century into a necessary chore for people to tolerate in order to be allowed to practice one's preferred specialty. Don't believe me? The majority of medical appointments these days are to jewel posts, but how often do you hear people describe themselves firstly as general physicians, even in smaller units? Yet job advertisements give them equal billing, because whether we like it or not, this reflects the real needs of modern hospitals and modern patients. I repeat, general medicine is the core business of Irish hospitals, and what we call a trolley crisis is in fact a general medicine crisis. My own ward rounds consist of roughly one-third gastroenterology and two-thirds general medicine patients. Because I am familiar and fully conversant with the gastroenterology material, I tend to see those patients much more slap snappily, because I can do so safely, leaving time for the complexity of the GIM component. In doing that, I'm shortchanging my gastroenterology patients, not to mention the trainees and the medical students, because I know the Clark Kent style I must change back into my gastroenterologist costume and prepare for the afternoon clinic before spending any spare moment trying to think of ways to develop and drive pathways and innovation in my own specialty. There are simply not enough hours in anyone's day to resolve all the tensions between specialty and general work. But if we continue to ignore the legitimate frustrations of those who keep the lights on in GIM, we will not revitalise generalism and patients will be the poorer for it. I return to Gandhi. Even though he was opposed to British rule in India, he encouraged 4,500 Indian doctors to enrol with the British forces to, in his words, share the responsibilities of membership of the empire, triggering the first wave of medical migration from the Indian subcontinent to this part of the world, from which this college and this country and its citizens have benefited enormously. It is now imperative that we do share the responsibilities of the empire that is the hospital and generalism must be saved. As I alluded to earlier, increasingly, patients have several long-term and acute conditions simultaneously. 
Medical journalism in acute care, the engine room, is key to making general hospitals run and flow. Many of you will remember this game that maybe you played on your old Nokia mobile phone 20 years ago when you should have been listening to a medical school lecture on how care is organised. Maybe you were right to do so because you would have learned that combining lots of different shapes is essential to win. M's are few and far between and must be afforded commensurate prestige and recognition, but it is the T's who keep the show on the road. I's complement them, but it is only with one or two M's and plenty of T's that we can easily complete the grid. The Mr and Mrs T's need to be offered adequate time to devote to the general medical part of their role. Seeing 40 patients on a medical post-take wardrobe before rushing off to an 8.30am clinic or endoscopy list is bad medicine in every sense, yet it is all too often a reality. General medical time could be condensed into blocks of time where other specialty duties are drastically reduced or shelved altogether. Patients and their families and society demands that the consultant be present. They need to be present. They want to be present. We won't get there tomorrow, and the best time to start was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. Training needs to focus far more on coordinated, planned care of individuals based on the patient's overall goals and priorities and on balancing the risks and benefits of treatments rather than simply on managing single diseases or organ systems. Thank you.